Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Beyond the Bar with me, your host, Denise Tova. This podcast is to truly go beyond the law. It is about revealing authentic people behind the titles and breaking down the stereotypes about legal professionals. And in today's episode, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce you to a trailblazing attorney and a friend, Christopher Chimeri. Chris is a founding partner at Cutella Chimeri. He oversees their matrimonial and family law and appellate practice areas. And he is notably an advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. So Chris, it is great to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. So, you know, I, I typically like to begin by asking my guests to share their story, but rather than asking you what inspired you to become a divorce attorney, um, can you share about a, uh, a personal event that had an impact on how you practice today? They're kind of blended, actually. The, my, my transition into matrimonial law was really shaped, I think, by childhood experience. I'm the product of, uh, of a high-conflict divorce. Uh, both my parents are lovely people, wonderful people, um, but unfortunately, as many people do when going through a difficult time in their life, maybe each lost their way a little bit, and that definitely impacted my teenage years. Um, my parents, I believe, separated when I was about 11 and a half, so from adolescence, early adolescence into the teenage years, it was marred by some family difficulties, and I have found, personally, that this brings a different perspective for me because it's not just giving clients, here's what the law is and here's what you should be doing or not be doing from a, a client-centric viewpoint, but also conjures that sort of counselor aspect of attorney and counselor at law uh, to help guide the family through what they're going through. Because I experienced it as a child. Um, those are memories that I keep with me and you know, like anything else from adversity often comes positivity. Mm. That actually is, uh, that is very perceptive and, and it's, I think it's courageous to sort of lean into, I guess you can call it a conflict, if you will, um, and as opposed to away from it uh, when you're dealing with a uh, with divorcing couple and, and especially with children, really understanding what it's like and bringing, you know, not, not always your perspective, uh, but just, just sort of uh, being able to, to understand it. And I think I could see how that would make you more, more effective. Uh, practitioner, you mentioned the word adversity. You know, there are so many success stories. As a matter of fact, I look on LinkedIn and there are practitioners who talk about their accolades and, you know, they have award of the year of, of that one and, and this one. There's nothing wrong with that. I think that is terrific. But I, I've always been interested in, in uh, when, you know, we experience setbacks and, and somebody overcoming adversity, you know, how to me, there's a wisdom in that and, and sort of how, how, how that happened. So Chris, you and your husband, Dennis, um, have been public about your relationship, navigating the complexities that come uh, with coming out. Can you share what the journey has been like for both of you? Absolutely. And it's one that I'm proud of, um, because again, I think all of our journeys shape us and, and that's what makes each individual a unique person. Um, my coming out story was before I entered the legal profession, um, but similar to the legal profession, which you know you talk about in your introduction, stereotypes and things that are stereotypical. Um, I was a competitive wrestler, uh, very athletic growing up, very immersed in that community, and you know coming out as an athlete in a in a town where there really were not very many out athletes. That was my my first experience with coming out publicly and you know the reception was mixed but you know by and large having a large network of friends and colleagues and having shared our stories with one another um, i think more positive than negative and i think my i've been able to use uh, sort of my relationships with people in those communities both you know first in the athletic community and then academia and then and then the legal profession I think I've been able to create uh, a broadening of horizons for some people as they've gotten to know me, the individual, as opposed to this person who identifies as gay. And I think that's a big distinction because labels tend to take away our individuality. And that's where oftentimes closed-mindedness can seep its way in. 
That is so wildly sad because it's it's byproduct of our, our bringing the messages. At least that's what I believe in, and and that's you know what sort of shapes our 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 uh, perceptions and. Uh, you know, it is amazing when you actually look underneath the surface and you are willing to listen to someone's story. Everybody has a story. Um, and But you, you are not your past. <laughs> you, you are not your future. You're not what you do. You know, you, you are so much more than that. And and so that is truly wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't subscribe to labels. And and I know that many of our, our uh, guests uh, don't either. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you are a huge advocate for the LGBTQ plus community naturally, and even co-founding um, uh, the LGBTQ law committee in Suffolk County, I believe. How has you coming out impacted that advocacy? I think it's created a personal passion for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on subject matter that's not esoteric, it's not theoretical. These are real issues that we're seeing in the law that are affecting real people. Um, oftentimes people that I may know or know of through different social or professional circles, you know, it, it just drives home that we're affecting real people's lives. You know, I was fortunate to work in 2016 on the New York State Court of Appeals case that changed the landscape of parentage, at least in some respects, within the state um, for same-sex parents. And it really reaches beyond the LGBTQ plus community, but that was the really the, the linchpin of what brought it to the court. And being a part of that matter and so many other matters that I've been fortunate to be uh, to work on over time has really just been such an experience because it's it's something that hits close to home. and you are passionate about and that is that is another um important aspect um you know we we've had many very interesting conversations and um you know we we talked about sort of the sometimes lines blur especially in the post covid era what you know where b b between the work and and personal life and as you know that the, your profession can be all consuming and as you've put it it is incumbent upon us to take care of ourselves. And I actually have to add to that because that brings me to a quote by Jim Rohn, um, someone I, I admire because he has such a practical application, um, a motivational speaker for those of you who are not familiar with him, highly recommend him, uh, personal growth sort of guru, but very practical. He used to say, um, listen to me very carefully, but do not watch me too closely. <laughs> I think it's so right on. But anyway, he had a quote and it said, I will take care of me for you. So can you share specific moments or experiences that led you to form new habits and routines that achieve sort of that balance? And, and, and how has that been for you? Absolutely. So I'll be the first to admit. And in fact, I think at this point, to me, I, I've made it a badge of honor. I was probably one of the worst professionals when it came to work-life balance for many years. I thought working more, uh, putting more time in, equated to better. Um, I, I think certainly to a large extent, this is not a nine to five job. Being a divorce attorney does conjure a blurred line. Um, and absolutely, you can't get good at what you do by working six or seven hours a day. So yes, this is a, a profession where we need to dedicate ourselves. We need to immerse ourselves in the material, but burnout is something that is not talked about enough and really just being able to be your personal best and your professional best you need to recharge the batteries right a car runs on gasoline or electric depending on what we're using that those those things need to be refueled and recharged uh somebody who's physically competitive an athlete needs to take recovery days likewise in an emotionally and intellectually and mentally stimulating profession that stress creates inflammation in the body and it creates uh, burnout and wear down. So you need to recharge your batteries. And I, and I would take vacations and then I would always be checking my emails or I'd be checking text messages. Um, even pre-COVID, I wasn't the best about it. And it was funny and I'll credit a good friend and former colleague of mine, John Fallon. Um, he set up a, a fishing trip in Alaska and there were six of us that had gone on a trip in 2021 over the summertime. And it was really a, just a fabulous trip. But for the first day, we flew into Juneau, Alaska, 
and we toured and we were looking around and everybody had cell service. It was no issue. So I'm communicating with the office, I'm instructing people, telling them how to get back to clients. Of course, within maybe 20 minutes of the seaplane ride to the fishing lodge, which is off on a remote island, the cell signal drops out, never to be received again for the rest of the eight days of the trip. Um, it was really an experience for me. Of course, at first, you know, that, that the angst starts going and you're worried about, oh my goodness, how, you know, everyone's going to think the plane went down. Uh, but the truth of the matter is within a couple of hours, you're in this beautiful natural setting, you're up in the Pacific Ocean and you see nature and you really start to almost reset with a natural circadian rhythm with your sleep. And, you know, it's a conducive environment to eating nutritiously. You're out on the ocean for 10, 12 hours during the day. So the salt air, you're away from all the toxins and electromagnetic waves we deal with every day. Um, and for about a year and a half, I was battling long haul COVID before that. Um, and I have to say, when I came back, uh, many of those symptoms had reduced so significantly that, I mean, I discussed it with my physicians. Um, and I said, you know, there's something to being able to take a reset and, and recharge. And so I implemented after that, not that I can go dark for eight to 10 days, multiple times per year, um, but I really do try once a quarter, even if it's just a long weekend, to do something that is completely personal in nature, to really reduce screen time almost down to zero. Um, obviously you're answering maybe a personal call or a text message, or if you're making plans with a friend, um, or you need use of the internet for something. But other than that, not answering work emails, not even looking at it. In fact, I turn my Outlook notifications completely off uh, when I'm off now. Um, and it's it's done wonders, I think, for my ability. And then when I come back, I'm fresh. And you probably have not missed anything monumental, right? The, the, the sort of line that I've developed when I tell people about that Alaska trip is the world did not end. I didn't get in trouble with any judges and no clients fired me. <laughs> so nothing <laughs> catastrophic happened. And I'm, and I have to credit is... my team. I mean, I have, I really, I have, I work with a tremendous group of attorneys, paraprofessionals, staff, um, not just my partner, Joe Quatella, but really my entire department in the firm. Uh, we have some really tremendous people working with us and, and we cover each other when we're out. You know, somebody needs to have a medical procedure. We cover each other. Somebody wants to take a vacation and it helps. You know, we, we spend a lot of time working together in the office to be on top of our cases and knowing what each other are doing so that we can help each other, which, you know, in, improves our own quality of lives. And then the sum of our, our parts become a better whole. Absolutely. And, and it's a culture that you are fostering and, and the team is so important. Um, and, and the, we have the need to connect. Um, and, uh, I'm sure it's, it's wonderful for them as well, knowing that, you know, it's usually comes from the top down that, that this is sort of the, the new healthy norm. Um, and, uh, that's, that's, a, that's great that you, you embody that balance and everybody on your team, uh, can do the same. You know, talking about interests and passions, you know, there's a difference between keeping yourself busy and, and taking on activity that's sort of a way to distract yourself, I say, away from yourself versus reconnecting with your passion and something that really fills you up. For me, it was starting this podcast, really, that has nothing to do with, with my work. What was that passion for you that you reconnected with? So, you know, we talk about this and, and you and I have, have discussed this even at other times, there's got to be something I believe balance really is defined as being passionate about everything that you have in your life. But really there's something, there's always something that just sits a cut above the rest. And for me, that is the wrestling community. My, my years as a wrestler really shaped who I am personally, professionally got me through tough times as a youth probably instilled a work ethic that I can attribute to what I do now professionally. And I had an opportunity about five years ago to rejoin the coaching staff in Massapequa. And I, I now uh, co-head the youth program there. Um, so second through eighth grade wrestlers, um, about eight to nine months out of the year, we're working with those students. And because I grew up in that community, it's doubly special for me because a lot of the students, the athletes that I'm coaching, their parents are people I grew up with. So even at my relatively young age, 
I can say I've known some of these parents for upwards of 25, 30 years now at this point. Um, and that is really, really special and near and dear to my heart. And, you know, it's, I, I devote about 12 to 15 hours a week to that, um, you know, commencing usually late October and, and going all the way until June. And it's really just a fabulous time. And it's something that is personally rewarding to me. It doesn't feel like work. I've had so many people say to me, why would you take on another obligation? You know, you work so hard for your clients. You know, now you're doing, you're giving more of yourself. And I, I said, I don't see it that way. Um, it's as rewarding to me as it may be influential or impactful for any of the people that I'm serving. Um, and that's the great thing about volunteer work. I think in general, um, find a passion and run with it. It's a great thing. That, that is actually great. Uh, finding a passion and running with it. Um, you can, <clears throat> as far as volunteering, um, it's easily said then down because there's so many great causes, but if you can add, uh, the, the passion element, you know, you will give so much more of yourself. Um, and this is, this has been really great discussion. Well, look, uh, I need to end on a rapid fire wisdom round here. So I'm going to throw something at you. What is a, uh, perception? Um, if, if there is a perception about, about family lawyers that you could change, what would that be? I think the perception that I would change for the general public about family lawyers is that all we do is effectively work through people's drama. I think it's a lot deeper than that. The area of work that we're dealing with conjures many different subject matters of law, but also there's a heightened level of responsibility because we're affecting the two to three things that are nearest and dearest to anybody, their children, their happiness, and their financial well-being. There are not three more important things. You need all of those in order to live well. And so it's incumbent on, on us as lawyers, and most of us take that responsibility extremely seriously and work hard with it. Um, and we are a great group. You know, the jurisdictions in which I practice, mostly Long Island, I've done some city work, I've done some Westchester work, but primarily Long Island by and large, um, we have a great bar. And I think the, all the lawyer jokes that are out there, you know, there's truth to every joke and, and there's some bad exceptions, right? And to everybody, but by and large, we're a tremendous group and a collegial and congenial one. Are you currently binge watching any shows? I am not. Uh, you might make fun of me for this one. The next one on cue is season two of The Lincoln Lawyer. I actually enjoy legal fiction when I'm reading books, and I enjoy shows and movies that have to do with the law. I loved Suits. I've watched it three times. Um, some of my favorite movies me too. are... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Th third time around. Yeah. Who's your favorite character in Suits, by the way? Is it Harvey or I'm Mike? Good. You want to root for Mike because even though he's doing what he shouldn't be doing, he's doing it for noble reasons. And mm -hmm. it's sort of this Aristotelian kind of analysis. Um, personality wise, I'm probably the most Harvey like. So I think I identify with that a little bit, but. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, look, that's a wrap. Chris, it has been super exciting having you here and thank you so much for sharing part thank of yourself. You. And uh, we'll, you, we'll have you back for sure. And thank you for uh, giving us a peek into your personal world. And for our listeners Hi. and viewers, you can find more about Chris in the description below. Uh, it is uh, bio link. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more candid conversations like this one. I am Denise Satova, your host, signing off from Beyond the Bar.